Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor David Haley, one of the associate pastors at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. It's my joy to welcome you today to uh, this video worship service on The Vine, which is our online campus. And we're so glad that you've chosen to join with us for this worship service. Our prayer is that God will speak to you and encourage you in your discipleship, in your faith, or perhaps even encourage you to find faith through the service today. So let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. I invite you to join with me for our opening congregational prayer today. The words will appear on the screen beside me, and I invite you to pray along with me. Let us pray. God of hope, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, you taught us that the worst thing is never the last thing. Help us to trust in you, even when we can't see you working. In the sure and certain hope of your love, we offer ourselves to you. May your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely? And long for heaven and home When Jesus is my portion My constant friend is he His eyes on the sparrow And I know he cares for me His eyes on the sparrow And I know he watches me I sing because I'm happy because I'm free His eyes on the sparrow And I know He cares for me His eyes on the sparrow And I know He watches me Let not your heart be troubled His tender word I hear And resting on His goodness I lose my doubts and fears Though by the path he leaded, but one step I may see, his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he cares for me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he's watching me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to get to lead us in prayer today. Will you join me now in prayer? 
Loving God, you are the author of life. We are here today because you formed us in our mother's wombs and breathed your breath of life into our lungs. We thank you for this world you have created, for this community you have called us to, and for all the ways we see your love at work around us. Lord, we know that when you created the world, you said that it was good. And yet we know that sin and death have invaded your good creation. Like the prophet Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones, we find ourselves looking around at this broken world and hearing the question, can these bones live? And like Ezekiel, we respond, O oh Lord God, you know. So God, we pray for the dry bones around us. We ask for your loving, life-giving power to show up in our lives, in our community, and in our world. We pray especially for those people and situations we name now before you, either aloud or in our hearts. Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayers. We thank you that even when it feels like death is winning, you are breathing new life into dry bones. So now, with the confidence that we are your beloved children, we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we transition now to a time of reflection and giving, I'd just like to remind you that you can always give to the ministries of Wrightsville United Methodist Church through our website, wrightsvilleumc.org, our cell phone app, and through the U.S. mail. Let us now continue to worship God. Wrightsville kids, I'm Pastor Julia. Today I have a really cool story to tell you. Once in Bible times, there was a man named Ezekiel, and Ezekiel is what is called a prophet. A prophet is someone that God calls to tell a message to God's people. Well, Ezekiel was alive when the Israelites, God's people, had been sent as prisoners to a different country called Babylon. And while they were there, everything seemed really bad. They had all lost their homes, they couldn't all be together, and life was terrible. So one day, God gave Ezekiel a vision. God showed Ezekiel a valley a deserted desert with dry ground and nothing green or pretty growing on it, kind of like this. And then, do you know what God showed Ezekiel next? In the middle of this dry valley, there were bones. All around, Ezekiel saw bones and they were dried up bones. They had been dead for a really long time. And God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? Can these bones come back to life? And Ezekiel didn't know what to say. So he told God, you know. Well then, God did something really crazy. God told Ezekiel, to tell the bones, those dry, dead bones, 
to come back to life. So Ezekiel asked and said, bones, come back to life. And all of a sudden, there was a rattling sound. And from all over, these different bones started to come and they gathered together and they made up whole skeletons like this. And then the muscles and the skin and hair and everything joined onto them too. And all of a sudden, there was enough to be a whole army standing in front of Ezekiel. God showed Ezekiel this amazing vision to tell him that even though things were really bad, there was still hope. God can make even terrible, really hard things wonderful again, because nothing is impossible with God. Let's say a prayer together. God, thank you that nothing is impossible with you and that life is even possible when we least expect it. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, I'm Doug Lane, senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And I'm glad to be able to bring you the word today. Our series on Assurance Certain Hope is uh, coming to a close. Uh, this coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. We'll be beginning the season of Lent uh, next Sunday. Um, and we're going to begin a new series called A Journey to Jerusalem. But today we're continuing to look at scripture that provides us hope uh, both then when it was written and even now today. We're in Ezekiel. We turn to the 37th chapter where the prophet says, The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied, and I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost, we're cut off completely, Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O my people, I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. And I will place you in your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy God, I pray that you will breathe into us again today. And that where we feel disconnected, Lord, that we will come back together. And we will rise up and be the people that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, they still tell the story at the College of William and Mary about crazy, magnificent President Ewell. For a century and a half, this prestigious Virginia school had been a leader among American universities, educating the likes of Presidents Thomas Jefferson, James Monroe, and John Tyler. But then came the Civil War. In the hard days of Reconstruction that followed, William and Mary went bankrupt. 
Soon it had a deserted campus, decaying buildings, no students. As with so many other southern schools after that tragic war, it was written off as dead by everybody. Everybody, that is, except its president. He had given his best years to advancing education through that school. He refused to give up now. So every single morning, President Yule went to that deserted campus, climbed the tower of its main building, and rang the bells calling the school to class. He acted as if the school was still there. People thought he was crazy. But for seven years, every day, President Yule rang the bells at William and Mary in defiance of the despair and hopelessness that would destroy everything that he held valuable. And eventually, miraculously, it all worked. Others caught his vision. Students, teachers, money all returned. And today, America's second oldest university thrives again because of the hope of a crazy, magnificent dreamer. Ezekiel was made from the same stuff as President Yule. This Old Testament prophet saw God in a fiery chariot and spoke of Jerusalem as a rusty pot that boiled its citizens. He ate scrolls and burned his hair to shock people into paying attention. But there was a method to his madness, for Ezekiel was also doggedly hopeful. He had two missions in life, to warn Israel of God's displeasure with her, and then, after she suffered his wrath and sat stewing in exile, to offer the promise that he would deliver them once again. Ezekiel is led by God in a vision to a valley of dry bones, a symbol for Israel's exile. God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I shall lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. And you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And sure enough, as Ezekiel spoke, the foot bone connected to the ankle bone, and the ankle bone connected to the leg bone, and the leg bone connected to the knee bone, and on and on until the bones became living people again. The vision of the Valley of Dry Bones was Ezekiel's summons to hope. These bones were Israel, broken as a nation, scattered throughout the land of exile, dry as fossils found in the desert. Only a divinely inspired vision could see them coming back together, first as skeletons, then as people, and finally as a nation. Only a crazy, magnificent vision. Today we live in an age of reason where such daring hope is written off as fantasy. Christianity is not so much hamstrung by little hope as it is little hopes. Petty, no-risk hopes too easily have become our stock in trade. We hope it doesn't rain on the church picnic. That Sunday's offering can match Monday's bills. That the beautiful couple sitting behind us will hold their marriage together for their children's sake. I hope for all these things because I've been taught to be practical and productive, a level-headed achiever. But this means setting our sights only on targets that we know we can hit. How different were God's people in the Bible? Those children of God who hoped for the most were rewarded with the most. Abraham set off across the desert for a promised land, sustained only by the wild promise from God that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars. Today, 4.3 billion, billion with a B, Christians, Muslims, and Jews claim Abraham as their father in faith. Ezekiel asserted that Israel could rise from its living grave as captives and return to its own land. And within a generation it was done, and Jerusalem was rebuilt. In the Gospels, countless blind, diseased, lame, and grieving people came to Jesus with painful longing in their eyes, and Jesus never failed to heal them. The leaders of God's church, more recently, have been just as expansive in their hopes. John Wesley gave birth to a greatly revitalized church because he created a method for reformation within the Church of England. Many of the early European settlers to these shores thought that America could be a city on a hill where Christians could worship freely. Today, integration and racial harmony are expected in America, 
even if it hasn't been realized, because Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and others dared to say, I have a dream. Crazy, magnificent dreams, perhaps, but awesome ones that, that give us hope for tomorrow. Our world craves open-hearted people who dare to dream big. For crying out loud, Russia's invaded Ukraine. China's sending over spy balloons. There are people in Central America who are running for their lives from drug cartels. Citizens of Turkey and Syria are grieving and homeless after the worst earthquake to hit that region in more than a century. We had another mass shooting on a college campus this week. Inflation remains high. The prospect of our two political parties working together remains low. In only one place can real solutions be born, in hope. No amount of work can change the world unless we can first conceive of that change. Hope is the conception of what might be. And such hope is more than just idle daydreaming. It's a life-giving power as real as the invisible energy that comes out of the electrical outlet in the wall. Carl Menninger tells about a group of doctors who survived the horrors of enslaved labor in a World War II concentration camp. Each night, they secretly came together and shared their knowledge in a small medical society. They believed that someday what they were learning and sharing would, might be of benefit to the rest of the world. And while scores of other prisoners around them died every week, almost all the doctors lived. As Messenger put it, they were kept alive by their hope. Is it any wonder the most lively committees and organizations of the church are those that have developed a goal, a vision for the future, and are eagerly working toward it? A vision of the future, what we call hope. It's the greatest animating force we know. Notice, though, to be realistic, hope must trust in a power greater than the problem that it faces. Hope must be grounded in someone or something, lest we become like King Canute, who's known for futilely commanding the tides to stop ebbing and flowing in the ocean. For many problems of the world, there's only one power great enough to encourage hope. That's why Ezekiel was quick to envision God, breathing those dry bones back to life. No one else could perform such a miracle. This kind of hope is more than wishful thinking. It's the absolute confidence that the future will be good because the future is God's. Some time ago, an adult Sunday school was discussing heaven. And the question was raised, are Christians so greatly concerned with eternal life that we've become insensitive to the world's needs and the human possibilities in this life? So heavenly minded that we're no earthly good, the saying goes. After some thoughtful discussion, the people present said, no, hope for the future in the next life is not a form of escapism from this one. Histories confirm that. The Christians who did most for this present world were those who thought the most about the next. The apostles who set out on foot to convert the Roman Empire by love and not by force. The reformers who promoted the Renaissance by giving glory to God through art and literature. The English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade in Europe, they all improved this life precisely because they were so concerned with the next one. As C.S. Lewis once said, it's since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that we are so ineffective in this one. Aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. To have high hopes is not to dream the impossible dream. With God, all things are possible, said St. Paul. The whole point of the resurrection was that God could take the worst possible fate, betrayal, shame, painful execution, and turn that into a victory. What is it that we pray in our congregational prayer each week? We know that the worst thing is never the last thing. In fact, the Christian realists are those who dare to dream, who think big, who have high hopes for what God can do. They've seen the inspiring power of the resurrection. It's those who refuse to dream who are out of touch with reality. As Christians, we believe in a fourth dimension. Beyond what we can see and touch is God invisibly active among us. So don't count God out simply because you can't understand God all the time. He certainly hasn't counted us out. 
I've told the story of Martin Luther before, how he suffered periods of depression when he thought his problems had become bigger than God's promises. And one day he seemed especially gloomy, so his wife Katie dressed herself up in black mourning clothes. And when Luther demanded to know why she was mourning, she said, well, I thought God had died. Luther got the message. Which brings me to another thing. After hope has led you to pray fervently and to place your problem in God's hands, that's when you need to expect the unexpected. God will never forget us, but usually he will surprise us. When Ezekiel told his people God would raise you from your graves, a return from exile was all he had in mind. Today we see these words as prophesying the resurrection. When God first told young Abraham he'd be the father of nations, God never mentioned that Abraham would have to wait until he was 100 years old to have a son. When King Solomon prayed to God for wisdom to rule instead of wealth, God delighted him with both. When downtrodden Israel under the Romans prayed for a Messiah to save them, no one dreamed he'd be born in a stable in Bethlehem and that his salvation would extend to eternal life. God will never forsake our open-hearted hopes, but he seldom gives us exactly what we expect. Usually his gifts are grander and often more surprising than we ever imagined. We hope for a cure for an illness, but instead we uncover untapped reserves of strength, love, and wisdom for dealing with it. We hope for adequate rain and a big harvest to end a famine, but instead we're overwhelmed by no nations to help the victims. We hope for happiness through a comfortable lifestyle, but instead we find joy in simple living. We pray that our church will rebound from the COVID pandemic while never thinking that another church would want to merge with us. Speaking of which, I feel like we're watching the bones come back together again right here at Wrightsville. You know, in January of 2021, we had zero people meeting in person for worship due to the COVID pandemic. We stayed together online and through other means of communication, but church looked very differently just two years ago. By January of 2022, we were worshiping in the sanctuary again and averaging 187 people per Sunday. In January of 2023, last month, we averaged 396 people per Sunday, more than double a year ago. What will it look like in January of 2024? Thanks to Youth Sunday last week, we're currently averaging 535 people in worship so far this February. Meanwhile, we had the largest new member class in more than eight years last weekend. It's magnificently crazy, this hope. It dares to believe an unseen God will enter our lives and influence our future. For countless Christians, though, it's the only thing that has pulled them through the pit of despair back into the light of God's blessings. You say hope in God's providence is an impossible dream in this messed up, muddled up, shook up world. You're right. But only the dreams that are impossible are the ones that are sure. For they are the ones that belong to God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, because of the resurrection, we can always hope. We know that the worst thing is not the last thing. You showed us in the valley of dry bones that life can come back together. It may not be what we, it looked like before, but we do have a future. A future with hope a future that you hold in your hands, a future that you know is good. Lord, help us to hold on when we feel like we're really struggling. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God tells us that the worst thing is never the last thing. There's always something more. Those bones will come back together. Jesus can be resurrected from the dead. We can have eternal life. 
we just trust in the Lord. He will give us hope. Hang on. Hang on to that sure and certain hope that comes from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go now in peace, go now in peace, may the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may be. Thank you.